Uh, greetings from Detroit. This is Todd Harden once again, uh, Head of Operations for Plastic Oceans International. We are once again conducting a one-on-one -on -one interview, this time with John McCarthy. John, one of my favorite people in the world, who uh, many of us in the organization got to know a little over a year ago in our grand adventure to Easter Island uh, with Sarah Ferguson. Um, John has, for the last three decades, um, been doing an awful lot of surfing, exploring, and adventuring um, across the world. He is the author of The Sexy, Ugly, Beautifuls, which we'll talk a little bit about a little bit later, as well as Swimming Easter Island, which is a book that we at Plastic Oceans International have published along with, with John. So with that, John from Durban, a uh, little south of Durban, South Africa. John, welcome to the, welcome to the conversation. How's it, Todd? Yeah, and uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, and uh, greetings to all your, uh, all your viewers. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it, listen, John, I mean, few people I think we've come across um, at Plastic Oceans that have been as intriguing and interesting and humble and kind as you are. So there's, there's my, uh, my initial uh, feel-good vibes towards you, but uh, all very valid and true, so very easy to say. So we, we appreciate you at every level. So, uh, and then everyone wow, does say hello from the organization. Thank you. That's amazing, Todd. Um, you know, I think that you guys do a great job and it's really cool. You know, it's cool for me just to play a small role in some of the adventures that you have. And uh, so, yeah, it's cool that, uh, that we can do these things together. Well, hopefully, um, hopefully many more adventures to come in the future. Um, well, listen, it's been, it's been one year since um, I alluded to a few seconds ago about Easter Island. We all went out there in order to help a a very good friend of yours and colleague, Sarah Ferguson, um, established a world record in human first. I mean, she became the first person ever to swim around um, Easter Island. One year later, you know, what's your take on it? What's, what do you, what's your takeaways from it? And maybe just a little bit about what the experience was for you. Oh, uh, you know, that was such an adventure. It really was. Um, one year down the line, reflecting on, you know, the what Sarah achieved was still a, a mind boggling feat. In fact, um, it's, you know, it was such a, such a tough physical thing to do and it had so many different layers to it. Um, and you know, we were successful as a team. You were part of that team. There was a much bigger group of people that made the whole thing happen. Um, and I think for me, the, the sort of, the one, the, the thing that I've taken away from it is what's possible with incredible teamwork, you know, uh, and with good vibes, like there was so much positive energy in that whole process. Um, and so on a personal level, the, the, the people that we met there were just, you know, absolutely incredible. Uh, and I, um, I just, yeah, I just, I have such appreciation for the, for the people there. And, uh, and I think that the, the lesson for us all really just down the line is you can achieve extraordinary things if, you, if you're well prepared and you're determined and you're motivated and you have a great team. Yeah, no, absolutely. It really was quite an experience for all of us. Up on the screen now, I'm sharing kind of some of the facts from the swim uh, that Sarah completed on March 16th. Boy, it was 40, about 40 miles, about 63K, and took just over 19 hours. Much of that, of course, you, you were in the water as the official navigator along with a team of uh, locals and, and well as Sarah's own, own team as well. So, yeah, um, boy, three, three jellyfish stings, 40, uh, 63K, 19 hours in the water. You know, when you come out of the water after such an experience like that, I mean, what was the first thing going through your mind at that point? Uh, we were, you know, we, we, the last part of the swim was just so incredibly dangerous. Uh, swimming through the surf, coming in through the very big waves at night. And the first thing, once we got through that dangerous surf zone, the first feeling I had was just intense relief. But when we swam around the breakwater into the little harbor, it was like we, we, we floated in there and it was just, the, the, the locals were shouting and you guys were all cheering and it was the most extraordinary extraordinary thing to experience it was you know it was really it was real this thing had happened you know it was amazing to be at that same place that we'd started off you know all those hours before and be back in there and 
yeah, it was just an extraordinary feeling. You know, I think I was for about two days. I don't think I landed properly after that. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I mean, you capture it um, quite well in um, in swimming Easter Island. Um, again, I'm going to share share a little bit of uh, what that looks like. This is the book there. You won't see me real well, but here's also the cover in my hand. Um, just a little bit about the book, if you could. Just a few seconds, a few minutes about, you know, the book. And, and, and the book is quite poetic. It's an amazingly quick and wonderful and beautiful read. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about the book and just how people can actually get it? Well, uh, you can. The, the quickest way to buy it is to get it off the Plastic Oceans website. And, um, you know, that's, that's, I'm sure you can share a link for that. Um, you will. Or they, if you're in South Africa, you can get it either directly from myself or Sarah Ferguson. But, um, you know, I wrote that book because I had all these thoughts. I, had, I just made some notes directly after the swim where I was like, I just don't want to forget this stuff. And um, I'm so glad that I did that because I go back and reread parts of that book now and, I, and I, I'm, I'm still amazed at what happened. Um, so it was, you know, it was intended just to, just, to, uh, just as a reminder, just to, you know, to, to, to share with people what an extraordinary adventure it was. And it's, you know, it's, it's a quick read. It's like 10,000 words and, um, you know, you can read it in, in an hour or two. And, um, I think that, well, I like to think that, you know, the reason that Sarah's, you know, did this incredible swim is to raise a, awareness for ocean plastic pollution. And, you know, I think what this book does is it just shows, just how determined she was and how well supported she was with such an amazing team of people around her, you know, and, and, you know, I, I hope that it inspires other eco warriors to go out there and, and pursue whatever it is that they're excited about protecting right. or drawing attention to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, listen, yeah, the book is available. You can go to swimming com. That'll take you basically to a page on our website where it's available um, as John said, if you're in South Africa and you want to uh, catch the book, you can do so, you know, through John or Sarah. Um, also through our homepage, you'll also find an easy way to go check out the book uh, through our store or shop on the website. Um, you know, shifting, <laughs> shifting gears just a little bit, we'll talk a little bit just about your other book, The Sexy Ugly Beautifuls. Um, which is which is a fantastic description. I love this description on here. A rock and roll collection of ocean infused adventures. Um, what's what's the book all about? And, and again, how can folks go about and find it if they want to buy it? Okay, so that book that book took me nearly twenty years to write. And again, it was just it was just recording little anecdotes and little adventures and stories that I've had in my travels around the world, mostly looking for good waves to go surfing and. You know, I've pretty much spent my whole life in and around the ocean, and um, it, it just and I enjoy the process of writing. So, at some point, I started realizing that if I put these all together, there may actually be a readable book in it, and and that's what I did. You know, and it's been it's been really a huge surprise to me how well received it's been. I'm yeah. I'm now yeah. in my, into my fourth print run here in South Africa. Wow. Great. I did a, a launch in London last year, which was blew me away. It was like it was it was packed, and I couldn't believe that, like people would come to a, an unknown South African writer's book launch in <laughs> London. So that was that was that was like really motivating for me. But uh, and then I've had people here, you know, coming up to me in the surf, going, "Hey, I read your book. That that is really cool, and I uh, really enjoyed it." So it's it's given me the the positive feedback that I've had has given me courage to you know to put more into uh, getting the book out there and, and just trying to get more people to read it. Um, it's, it's been a, hu a hugely fun journey. Like, you know, uh, as a first sort of book, um, I've just had a lot of fun with getting it out and sharing it with people. And, and, uh, I, I, you know, I think there's still quite a lot to do. I mean, I, you know, I'd really like to tour it in, in various other parts of the world other than South Africa and the UK. Um, right. So, yeah, we'll see how we go once all this new reality sets in. And, um, uh, you know, I'll, the book is available. It's, it's on Amazon. You can, you can get it. Um, if you go to the sexy, ugly, uh, you can, you can order it online there. Um, so, 
I love writing about the ocean and um, I've had great feedback from people who, who are not really ocean goers. You know, they're not surfers or free divers or swimmers, but they, they, they enjoyed the description and the, the adventures and the way that I think and, and write about the ocean, you know? So for me, this blue stuff behind me is a very important, it's a very important part of my life, whether I'm surfing or swimming or paddling or free diving, you know, it's most days I'm, I'm in the ocean doing something. Um, and then, yeah, just the creative process of writing and tying the two together uh, has been, it's just been a great, a great creative project. For me. We are being censored. You, um, you are the subject of a film by uh, director, this fellow South African, I believe, but fellow Durbanite is Bruce Buttery, and it's called Sea Change. It's one of the films that we're very lucky to have um, in our film library. It's now a few years old, but still just an amazing film to watch, beautifully shot. Um, I think we've now had, um, you know, over 100,000 plus people um, viewing it. I'm, I've got some of it shared up on the screen right now. Um, a little, just a little info about what that film is and, and what it, what it's meant to you. Well, it's something that's, I'm really passionate about. I think firstly, I must compliment Bruce because he, he did an incredible job with the filming and editing of that, um, of that film. But basically what the film does is it documents, it documents my journey looking for a more environmentally friendly surf craft. And over the last decade or so, you know, I've realized that the, the tools of our trade as surfers are generally not great on the environment. And so I've dedicated a lot of my time and energy to trying to find more environmentally responsible ways for us to build surfboards. And I'm really, really excited about where we've got to now because we have surfboards that are super functional, really high performance, but uh, are much, much kinder on the environment than the conventional uh, toxic surfboard. So what I'd like to see now, the next sort of stage is, I mean, you know, the amazing thing when that there's a hundred thousand people that now have seen that story, uh, you know, and, and that's how, that's how, that's how you change things. You've got, it's about education. And, and so hopefully what we start to see from here is surfers becoming more aware of, of what they use to ride waves and seeking more environmentally uh, responsible alternatives, which we now have. Right. You know, you have an organization called um, Ocean Child, correct? In which you kind of uh, really teach people how to be comfortable in the water and the ocean. Uh, what, give us a little bit about what kind of trainings you offer uh, through Ocean Child. Well, what, you know, what, ha what happened with me is because I've been exposed to so many different types of activities in and around water, I've had the, the really good fortune to learn a lot from some amazing people. And I, you know, what I've basically done is I've, I've reduced that knowledge into a body of work, which just helps people to be safer and more comfortable and calm in the water. And then what I like to do um, is I like to take my students and we go into wilderness areas where there are not a lot of other people. And I basically host these surfing, yoga, and free diving wilderness adventures. So we go to low traffic areas like southern Mozambique and northern parts of KwaZulu-Natal, some parts of Namibia and, and the Transkei Wild Coast. Um, and yeah, these adventures are just about getting back to nature and connecting with nature and trying to reform a dialogue with nature while you do healthy things in beautiful places, you know. So that's pretty much what Ocean Child... Ocean Child as a brand represents um, a mindful approach to... To, to everything you do, being as a consumer, as a surfer, as a human being. It's just about, you know, trying to be gentler on our planet, but at the same time, taking advantage of the amazing things to do on this planet. So, I mean, I've, I've got some very cool collaborative projects on the go. Um, I'm working with some amazing surfboard builders uh, to build greener surfboards, working on some clothing things where we are making more environmentally responsible surfing board shorts and yeah just you know it's just about having that relationship and that awareness and that mindfulness that um you know we need to look after nature and we need to be respectful of nature and, and just try and be more gentle in our approach 
No, absolutely. And it's, you know, I've, I'm, you know, I think we've all seen a lot of this information during this pandemic, uh, COVID-19, coronavirus, you know, this kind of, um, you know, potential rehealing of the earth is if there is anything positive that come out of it, um, it is maybe to appreciate, you know, appreciate the planet a little bit more, give the planet a break and even appreciate the small things that we take for granted, such as, you know, maybe, maybe our, our, our need to be, you know, social creatures and such. Um, so John, obviously, you know, you there in Durban and South Africa, everyone in the global world, we're all experiencing this pandemic right now. Um, I think you guys have had about 60 deaths, about 30, about 3000 cases, obviously much different than here in the U S although a much smaller population as, as, as well. And who knows how good or bad reporting is, but what are you seeing there? What are you experiencing um, both locally around Durban and South Africa in general, as far as the vibe and feel and your take on this pandemic um, as related to South Africa? Well, I think the thing to realize with South Africa is that we have a, both a first and a third world coexisting in one country. And in the first world, it's business as usual. We, we obviously, we can't have, um, we can't have, you know, uh, gatherings and we, we can't move around because we're in this intense lockdown. But um, in the third world, that's really where we've got problems emerging big time. Um, we have a massive amount of people who live in highly densely populated areas. These guys, they live hand to mouth. And so what's happened in the last three to four weeks in our lockdown is these guys have basically run out of food and they don't have any form of medical um, uh, help, they are locked in these townships and the situation there is becoming quite serious and quite desperate. But for the privileged people like myself, uh, you know, it's, it's basically being uh, like a holiday in our homes. Uh, it's easy to do social distancing. It's, it's easy to stay away from, you know, other people. Um, but I, my, my heart really goes out to the... Um, you know, the people living in those impo impoverished communities. What's been really cool to see, though, is how, in, especially in the surfing community, um, what the guys, the surfing and diving communities have been doing is that they have been rallying to create uh, food delivery mechanisms into mm. these areas. So there's a place called Elans Bay on the West Coast where um, it's a, there's a great surfing spot there. And one of our sort of surf gurus from the Western Cape, a guy called um, Greg Birchish set up a GoFundMe thing and he's been delivering food parcels into this impoverished community. The same thing is happening in Jeffreys Bay. The same thing is happening in Sudwana. So it's been really cool to see South Africans mobilizing to try and help other South Africans that are in worse situations than they are. But uh, I think now, you know, we're sort of in week four of, a, of this lockdown. We are really starting to chafe under the intense restrictions that our government has put on us. You know, uh, we have a prohibition that's been put on us as well. So we, we're not allowed to drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes. Um, you know, there's been some really, really uh, heavy things. A guy outside my house here tried to go spearfishing the other day and he got arrested and he spent three days in jail before he could go to court. And now he has to go for another further two weeks of self-isolating because he shared a crowded jail cell with a whole bunch of guys that had been caught in a sweatshop. So, you know, it's complicated and it's, it's, it's really heartbreaking in some areas, but there, there are these little silver linings. And it's, for me, I'm, you know, I just try and help wherever I can. If I can see this help needed in, in Elans Bay, well, then I'm happy to support and buy some food parcels there. If there's guys doing good work in Jeffreys Bay, same thing and the same thing in Sudwana. And I think we really need to do this now. We, you know, we need to help each other. Unfortunately, you know, South Africa's what, what, because of this first and third world thing that way we live, um, we, we were a pretty lawless society before this lockdown. And in fact, our average murder rate every day is much higher than our, than, than our coronavirus, uh, sure. death rate, sure. you know? So, and, and we just, we don't have the resources, you know, we don't have the resources that fully developed first world countries have. We don't, we are not able to continue to pay everybody's salaries. It's just, we don't have that depth of money. So the next, uh, our next challenge is going to be the post lockdown 
economic meltdown uh, for a lot of people here. And you, we, you know, hungry people are angry people. And so I think that you know, we've just got to try our best to get food back into these poorer communities and stabilize the economic thing as quickly and as um, painlessly as possible. And I think that's going to be quite a difficult thing to do, actually, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's a beautiful country. It's very sad. A lot of the, the social issues they do exist there, but hopefully uh, better, times, uh, better times ahead for, for sure. Um, you know, and, and what's ahead for what's ahead for John McCarthy? What's next on your on your uh, big project list? Once uh, we'll say once we get back to normal, <laughs> if we well, get the back. First, to normal. The first thing I'm going to do when we get out of lockdown is go surfing, and then shortly after that, I'm going to go diving, and then I'm going to go swim in the sea. But um, no, really, at the moment, you know, we, we're working on the Swimming East Island book with with Plastic Oceans, and that's that's a really cool project. Um, I'm looking forward to getting the Spanish version of that out, which will be very exciting to actually have that book available in Chile and Rapa Nui itself. Um, so that's going to be an amazing, um, amazing chapter to that, that part of the, uh, the story. I've actually started writing another book, uh, which has been great to do in this time. You know, I'm usually so busy running around that I don't have time. And, uh, and what's, and I've what's the topic? No, this is fiction. This is, so this is okay. a, it's a novel. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, very You'll good. Have to wait. Give me six months or so. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it'll also depend on how long this lockdown goes on for, how quickly I get the book done. Um, it's just trying to stay healthy and positive, you know, so doing lots of yoga, uh, trying to eat well, um, enjoying the time with my kids and my, and my wife. Uh, my dogs think that they've died and gone to heaven. They're getting so much love. They've never seen us around so much. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think for us, everyone's just, we, there's a lot of uncertainty about the next two to three weeks. Once that, once we sort of can move past that, then it'll be like, well, okay, cool. What do we do? I've started teaching my water safety course online. So I, um, that's been a very interesting learning curve for me. Um, and I think, you know, it was something that you were saying earlier, you know, the world's getting a break right now. And I, I really like to think that we're going to rethink how we do everything after this. Yeah. I think a lot, a lot less air travel, a lot more of these kind of meetings like we're talking now. It's interesting to see the changes in education and how quickly my kids have adopted to online learning. Um, it's yeah. not perfect, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the most amazing things about humans is that when we face with these massive challenges, we, we, we rise to them, you know, and yeah. that's kind of what's happening at the moment. So, just on a personal level to stay positive and fit and healthy and creative, keep creating. And then broadly, you know, once, once the cards fall where they land, then try and figure out what the next three months, six months and two or three years is going to be like, but it's going to be different. You know, uh, that's for sure. No, absolutely. Well, this is, we've been talking, I've been talking with John McCarthy. He is the author of swimming Easter Island. This chronicles Sarah Ferguson's world first circumnavigation uh, swim around Rapa Nui. Um, he's also the author of uh, The Sexy Ugly Beautifuls. You can find that at thesexyuglybeautifuls.com. You can find information about Ocean Child at oceanchild.co.za. Um, you're also going to be seeing these URLs up on the screen above, right here, where I'm pointing as I talk about them. Um, Swimming Easter Island, by the way, you can go to swimmingeasterisland.com. That'll take you to a page on our website where you can purchase the book. Uh, John, I thank you for your time. It's been a great conversation. I can't wait to do it in person at some point in the near future, hopefully. Fingers crossed. And, uh, you know, best wishes to you and your family. Give Sarah Ferguson a big uh, virtual hug for us if you happen to see her in the virtual space. Uh, we know that uh, she got past coronavirus, but has still been a little bit under the weather. So our thoughts are with her. Um, with you, the entire team down there that we know so well. So thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Todd, thanks for having me on. Good to chat to you.